Greetings, this is Dr. John Wineland again, and uh, we are back today talking about Barton W. Stone, one of the leaders of the Restoration Movement, sometimes called the Stone-Campbell Movement. You can see my backdrop here uh, behind me is the Cane Ridge Meeting House. This is a uh, meeting house. I'll show you a map a little bit later, but it's in Kentucky. It's a two-story log structure <clears throat> that uh, where Barton W. Stone would minister for many years, and it was the home of the Cane Ridge Revival that we will uh, talk about as well. This is a place that I know pretty well. I've probably been there, I don't know, 25, 30 times, taken students there and other groups there to show them. Uh, you can still go see it today. It uh, doesn't look quite like this today because it is encased in a stone. Uh, and there's a stone structure over the top of it, limestone with steel girders to protect it. And that happened in the late 1950s. It had been completed in the early 1960s. So it's been protected in this way, the building uh, looked like this for many years and was then <clears throat> modernized, I guess what they would say, by putting um, white clapboard siding on it to make it look more like a uh, more modern church. And uh, later on, though, when when people decided to sort of restore it, back to what it looked like, then the concerns came from insects, woodpeckers, and other things like that were beginning to uh, destroy the building. So uh, money was collected, and a large superstructure was placed over the top. All right, so let's, let's take a look at Barton W. Stone's life then today. Barton W. Stone, you can see a very nice representation of him here. Off to the right, this is a bronze bust of him, which now sits just outside the Cane Ridge Meeting House. And uh, <clears throat> this is near, near his grave as well, because he is buried near the Cane Ridge Meeting House as well. Let's move forward and let's talk a little bit about let's move forward then and we'll talk about the beginnings of Barton W. Stone's uh, life. Here is a uh, drawing of him of Barton W. Stone. You can see uh, later in life. Uh, Barton W. Stone was born in 1772 on Christmas Eve near a place called Port Tobacco, Maryland. This is uh, near the coastal areas, as you might imagine, uh, a port there. And of course, uh, the United States was forming at this time. This is a tumultuous time in the history of the formation of the country, and this will cause the Stone family to eventually move to Virginia, <clears throat> and they will move to the sort of western part, southwestern part of Virginia. But Barton W. Stone, if we think about him when it comes to religion, he begins his life as an Anglican. It's that his family were Anglican, or uh, we might call it Church of England. Of course, at this time, when there's a lot of troubles with the Revolutionary War, people don't want to call it the Church of England, so they call it the Anglican Church, or eventually it's called the American Episcopal Church. Now, Barton W. Stone also has contacts with Baptists and Methodists in his uh, sort of religious journey, and certainly, as we're going to see, with the Presbyterians as well.
Now, one of the things that bothers Barton W. Stone as he is <clears throat> developing his own ideas here, he is concerned about the religious disputes that he sees within Christianity, within the church, that people do not get along with one another. And this really uh, bothers him. And so we're going to see this will become a theme in his life. And uh, his ministry, in fact, is uh, unity. Unity is going to be, as um, it has been called, his polar star, his north star, his directional motivation in life. Well, uh, Barton W. Stone is not looking at all to be a uh, minister at this time, but he is looking to get education. He's interested in becoming a lawyer. That's his uh, initial interest. And since he's living in western Virginia at this time, they had moved from Maryland, and they had moved right about in here in Virginia, in the hills. Um, and so he travels to the south. He hears about a school that's there. It's called the Guilford Academy. Sometimes it's called the Log College. And it's near Greensboro, North Carolina. And he'll go here to study uh, with 50, about 50 students, 50 other students. And this is David Codwell here. He is a Presbyterian minister who runs this school. And uh, by all accounts, an excellent education could be had here, uh, where Barton W. Stone will eventually receive instruction not only in sort of biblical theological studies, but Greek and uh, Hebrew, Latin. You know, he studies languages. He's very gifted at languages. And uh, while he's not looking to become a minister, the, the school requires a chapel, as many schools do, it requires a chapel study. So uh, we'll see here that uh, James McGreedy comes to the college, and James McGreedy, pictured here, will preach at the school. He has a very... Uh, fire and brimstone kind of sermon, not the kind of sermons that we hear too much of today, the fire and brimstone. When's the last time you heard a good fire and brimstone sermon? I don't know. I don't hear too many of them today, but of course, uh, I don't hear all the sermons that are out there. But the idea that everyone is a sinner, the idea that the wages of sin is death, the idea that if you don't repent, you will go to hell. Basically, we don't we don't talk too much about hell anymore. We don't even like to use that word, eternal punishment, um, because of your sins. Well, at any rate, Barton W. Stone hears this fire and brimstone sermon. He is convicted he is a sinner, but he does not, Barton W. Stone does not describe this as the place where he is uh, decided to convert to Christianity. Uh, it will actually be about a year later when he hears a sermon by William Hodge, another fairly famous preacher at the time who came to speak at the college, and he spoke on the love of God. And I think this is a good indication of Barton W. Stone's um, thinking. He is much more motivated by God's love than by uh, God's punishment. I think that would be safe to say. So unity, the unity of the church, unity of people, and God's love. These would be two big themes for Barton W. Stone. Well, Barton W. Stone will at this time decide eventually to become a minister. And uh, so he will he will decide to do this. Now, it's, it, it's a process of becoming a minister a little different than it is today. For example, uh, if, if you're like me, you're maybe accustomed to 
each congregation deciding who will preach on a given Sunday. And uh, there is no sort of structural authority over the top of the local congregation that would say, well, this person can preach and this person cannot. But we're going to see that at this time, there was actually a process called being licensed to preach. This was uh, not exactly the same as being ordained a minister, although it's probably a step in that process. So you had to be licensed to preach, to preach in any church, and so Barton W. Stone was not yet. He's seeking that. They have to review him and so forth. And uh, we'll see in 1793 he will seek that uh, license. Now, uh, we should say theologically, Barton W. Stone had a few questions about predestination. We're going to see he's got a lot of problems with Calvinism and the idea that some have been sort of arbitrarily chosen to be among the elect and others have not. He also has questions about the Trinity. And uh, part of that, I believe, is because the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. I think the concept is clearly taught. But Barn W. Stone was, um, well, you know, he was, he was being quite cautious when it came to using terminology that wasn't found in the Bible. So some have tried to call him a Unitarian. I don't really think he was a Unitarian. He certainly believed in the uh, Jesus as being divine. But this was one of the criticisms leveled against him because of his questions about the Trinity. Well, at any rate, he will go off in 1795 and 1796, and he will go down to the, again, sort of northeast part of Georgia. If you've been down in that area here in Georgia, it's, again, a part of the mountains. So this is South Carolina here. He was up in North Carolina. And uh, so this is territory, a similar kind of terrain that he is used to. And what does he teach? He teaches languages here near Washington, Georgia, at the Succoth Academy. And uh, this is why I'm telling you he was gifted in languages. Uh, some people are. Some people aren't. But uh, he, he seems to uh, be quite gifted at it. You know, one of the other languages that he learns here is French. Because if you take a look at those dates, 1795, 1796, you take a look at what's going on in France at the time, uh, you'll probably recognize that this is the time of the French Revolution. And so there had been a man who had left France because of all the turmoil there, and he had come here to this academy and he was teaching French. So Barton W. Stone actually studied French with him, so he's sort of gathering languages that he has studied and, and has learned, French being one of them. Now, we also know that he uh, knew Cherokee, the Cherokee language. In fact, we know that he, he could preach in the Cherokee language. He was so fluent and he could preach, and he did preach to Cherokee, uh, Cherokee people. Where did he learn this? Well, you know, he lived in the sort of the mountains, the hills of Virginia, North Carolina, and now uh, Georgia. This is all Cherokee country. And so he had a lot of interactions there with the Cherokee people. In fact, if you go to the Cane Ridge Meeting House, you see the picture behind me, Today, there is a small museum that's there, and uh, it has in it a lot of interesting things, but one of the things in it in particular uh, are some of the writings, I mean, handwritten things of, of Barton W. Stone, one of which is a sermon that he preached, and it's written in phonetic Cherokee, phonetic Cherokee. Why? Because Cherokee did not have a written language at that time. There was no written Cherokee language at that time. And Barton David Stone, since he knew it, he kind of wrote out his notes for his sermon, wrote out his sermon in phonetic Cherokee. 
sort of help him as he was preaching uh, to the Cherokee people. Well, anyway, that's an interesting thing. If you ever get to the Cane Ridge Meeting House, be sure to go down and take a look at the museum and uh, look in particular for that for that sermon that's there. Now, the, the other thing you'll see there is that Barton W. Stone was opposed to slavery. And uh, there there's some of his writings, sort of sermons there about being opposed to slavery. And in fact, his opposition to slavery will cause him eventually to leave Kentucky, where slavery was legal, and to move to Illinois, where it was not. Now, uh, Hope Hull operated this school in Georgia. And uh, this is a connection to the O'Kelly movement. Remember, we uh, have mentioned O'Kelly before. Um, and this is in was up in North Carolina. But so this this college has that that connection as well. Well, it, it, by 1796 in that year, uh, Barton W. Stone becomes licensed to preach. And so he will head out to a congregation to begin preaching, which will be what he will do. Well, teaching and preaching is what he's really going to do uh, for most of his life. Well, his early preaching then, he is sent to southern North Carolina. Southern North Carolina and the Orange, it was called the Orange Presbytery. So I don't want you to get confused. It's not northern South Carolina. It's not northern North Carolina. It's not southern South Carolina. It's southern North Carolina. I always try to make things clear. And I know directions, a lot of directions here we're going to be talking about. But he's there, and, and guess what? He's not that happy. He gets discouraged. Why? Because, you know, he's highly motivated. He wants to proclaim the love of God, the unity of people. He wants to have people respond. I think as any, uh, as any uh, minister would, would want would be for people to respond to your preaching, your teaching, for the people then to get involved. But he gets discouraged here because it's not what he thought it would be. And this happens sometimes in ministry, but you have to persevere. <clears throat> well, he decides to move west. He has heard this is the land of opportunity. And by the west, at this time, this means Tennessee and Kentucky because that's beyond the mountains, and this is the West at the time. So he will arrange a, a, a way for him to get to Tennessee. He gets hired by a man from North Carolina to take some horses and to sell them for him. This, the, well, the horses have been sold. He has to deliver the horses to a little town called Nashville, Tennessee. And by the way, Nashville, of course, today is a big, big city. At the time, it was a very small town. And in fact, not a very uh, happening place. <laughs> not a place where a lot's going on. And he runs into one of his old classmates there, uh, John Anderson. And John Anderson says, Barton, you know, if you really want to go to a place that is happening and a place of opportunity, you need to go to Lexington, Kentucky. Lexington, Kentucky at the time was called the Athens of the West. And it was a bigger uh, city or town than Nashville by far at that time and a place where a lot was going on. And so uh, the two of them said, hey, let's, let's go up there and see what we can find. They go to Kentucky. They go to Lexington area. And here is where Barton W. Stone will reside, and he'll kind of have his, a lot of his life centered around uh, sort of the Lexington area, Lexington, Cane Ridge, Georgetown, that, those areas. So in 1796, he began to preach at the Cane Ridge Meeting House that I have on this map here. Here's where Lexington is located today, of course, much bigger today than it was in Barton's time. And here is Paris, Kentucky, a bit to the north and east of Lexington. And then if you go 
basically about eight miles out to the east of Paris, and it's still today a very much country area. This is horse country, by the way. If you've ever been to Kentucky, you, certainly you've heard about the Kentucky thoroughbred horses and Kentucky Derby and all that sort of thing. There's a lot of horse farms here. And beautiful, beautiful horse farms uh, with sort of rolling, rolling countryside and beautiful fences and grass and so forth. Well, uh, it was it was pretty remote at this time. Cane Ridge Meeting House is where Barton W. Stone will begin preaching and also a place that was sort of off to the northeast called Concord. Concord. So there's two churches. He's preaching at two churches. This was not uncommon because the the need for uh preachers was high and uh you know this was a place uh, where where he could work and so they would they would rotate maybe first and third sundays at once second and fourth at the other that kind of thing and they would go back and forth now the cane ridge meeting house was uh, a tremendous meeting house certainly for its time it can hold 300 people maybe more depending on the situation. It's two stories. It has a balcony and um, Barton will preach here for uh, several years. Now Concord and Cane Ridge were started by a Presbyterian minister named Roger, Robert Finley. Robert Finley will kind of go on a journey himself. <clears throat> he'll eventually end up in Ohio and he'll be a Methodist. So he'll switch from Presbyterian to Methodist eventually. But according to some reports here, part of the reason he left, even though he had helped build this church and build all this up, is they said he could not sit his horse. Now remember, uh, Paris is in Bourbon County, Kentucky. You may have heard of Bourbon. I'm sure only in the theoretical sense. But Bourbon, of course, uh, comes from Kentucky. In fact, I believe the name bourbon can only be used of certain alcoholic beverages that come from Kentucky. And in fact, they originated in Bourbon County, which gets its name from uh, the Bourbon dynasty of France, actually. Uh, but uh, Bourbon County. Now, it, you know, sometimes ministers will be paid mm, in different ways. Yeah. I mean, you know, today in our uh, larger churches and so forth, there are contracts and uh, money and so forth. But when you when you preach at a country church, like I used to do in Kentucky, actually, uh, you might get paid in different ways. I used to get paid in uh, some, partially anyway, in uh, sometimes in food, uh, eggs, chicken eggs. Uh, one of the ladies in the church would bring me a dozen or two chicken eggs every once in a while from her chickens. Some would bring me uh, sweet corn or beans or uh, things like that from their gardens. So you would receive food, okay, and other, uh, other sort of things like that. Well, at this time, uh, Robert Finley evidently was receiving some of his pay in bourbon whiskey, uh, in part because you could take that bourbon and you could sell it for cash money and use that to buy other things. Now, it seems as though perhaps uh, Mr. Finley also began to imbibe a bit in the, the local beverage and uh, perhaps got himself in a little trouble. At least people, the rumors were that he couldn't sit a horse, and that, of course, was considered to be, well, not a good thing at this time in Kentucky if you can't get up in the saddle with your horse and uh, ride from place to place. So it was embarrassing. Yeah. Well, anyway, let's move on. The Cane Ridge uh, Meeting House or Church was built in 1791 and was used continuously until 1921. 1921. So as you can see, for 130 years, they had services in this building, um, pretty much on a weekly basis. But 
The problem was the congregation was getting smaller, the upkeep was getting higher, and eventually the church was, uh, the congregation abandoned the building, and it was starting to get in disrepair when it was purchased and sort of restored back to this uh, log, so you know, so you could see the logs. And it was purchased actually by uh, a, a Cane Ridge Meeting House Historical Society, I think they begin to call themselves, or Preservation Society. And they are connected with the Disciples of Christ Historical Society today. Uh, it was then in the 1950s they decided to put a superstructure over it. They used local limestone, put it over the top, steel girders to protect it from trees falling, branches or whatever to, that would hurt the building, uh, keeping insects and uh, animals away from it and so forth, keeping it dry as well so it wouldn't rot. So uh, this building you know, is well preserved now, and uh, I hope, I suspect, it'll be around for quite a while to come because of this superstructure building. Well, there you can see in this uh, in this image a picture of this building that's behind me now. But look, look here. You see the stone, the limestone, the local limestone that they built the building out of, the superstructure over it, the steel girders, and then the roof that's over it. So as you can see, this is completely encased by another building. They built it around the Cane Ridge Meeting House which means that this building should stay in great shape for many years to come. At least I hope so. Well, it's in this building then in 1798 that Barton W. Stone will finally be ordained. He'd been licensed to preach, you remember, but now he'll be ordained. And it'll be in this, this uh, church, this, this meeting house. And... He's here to be a part of the Transylvania Presbytery. Now, Transylvania, of course, that probably makes you think of vampires, perhaps sparkly ones, uh, that I don't quite understand how that goes against all the laws of vampires. But anyway, it's got nothing to do with vampires anyway. Transylvania, if you remember when we talked about Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania is Penn's Woods. And Transylvania, this talks about forest or woods, it means you're, you've gone across the woods. So you, you've transferred across uh, the woods. So that's what it means, Transylvania Presbytery. Well, here during this uh, ordination ceremony or service, uh, Barton W. Stone is asked to affirm his uh, belief in the standard Presbyterian creed, which is called the Westminster Confession of Faith. Uh, this was written down in 1647, so it had been around for quite a while, about 150 years at this time. And uh, Barton W. Stone, of course, remember, is questioning Calvinism, predestination, and he has some questions about the Trinity. Both these things are prevalent in this confession especially this idea of Calvinism and predestination. So when he is asked, or when the ceremony takes place here, they question him and say, okay, do you accept the Westminster Confession of Faith? To which he's supposed to say, yes, of course. But what does he say? Well, he says, I, I do as far as I see it consistent with the Word of God. Now, um, if I was running this ceremony, that would send up what we like to call a red flag. Wait a minute, what do you mean, as far as you see it consistent? Of course it's consistent with the Word of God. It's the Westminster Confession of Faith. Well, they didn't say that to him. They didn't stop it right there. They didn't say, no, we we got to look at this more carefully. Um, basically, I don't really know what they were thinking. I think maybe they were thinking, this guy, we need him. As a minister, he's already serving two congregations. He says he accepts it, 
as far as it's consistent with the Word of God. So the way I'm going to interpret that perhaps at this moment is, of course, it's consistent with the Word of God. All of it is consistent with the Word of God, and so we're just going to accept that uh, and accept Him. Well, nobody challenged the, the statement, whether they just, you know, misunderstood, perhaps were eager to have him or uh, rationalized it in some way. But he was wrestling with predestination especially, and he uh, reveals later that, of course, he uh, will soon reject it if he hadn't already. But he never, he just decides, I'm not going to publicly announce my rejection of, of this. And so that's part of what's going on with him. Now, remember we said he is eager. He wants people <clears throat> to be enthusiastic. And this is what's going to lead to another uh, event, a pivotal event in his life. And this will come in 1800. It goes back to James McGreedy. You remember, this is the same guy that preached at the chapel when Barton W. Stone had heard him, so he knows who he is. It's a Presbyterian minister. And in Kentucky, there will be, uh, organized by James McGreedy, uh, what is known as the first camp meeting in June of 1800, or sometimes called the Great Revival of 1800. And most people see this as the starting point of the Second Great Awakening. Well, Bart W. Stone is very concerned about a decline in sort of religious enthusiasm. He hears that James McGreedy, a man that he knew, was going to have this interesting event, this meeting called a camp meeting, something new in 1800. Sounded interesting, and Barton W. Stone decides to attend. This is the same man he heard preach in the school, and so uh, he will go um, and hear this, and then he will be so moved that he will decide that he wants to have his own camp meeting. And that he does. He says of uh, he says of this Gasper. Uh, River Revival, Gasper River Church Revival, uh, that it was his conviction that it was was complete, uh, his complete conviction that it was the work of God. Now, not everybody thought this about revivals. There were new lights and there were old lights. Barton W. Stone here is obviously a new light because he accepts revivalism. Many were of the old light persuasion which did not accept uh, this kind of revivalism. Well, because of what happened there, this really encourages Barton W. Stone to intensify his preaching and to um, and he decides to actually hold two camp meetings one at the Concord Church, and one at Cane Ridge. And so about a year after the meeting he had been to, he is holding his own meeting at Concord Church, again, a bit north and east of Cane Ridge. Approximately 4,000 people attended this meeting, and this really encouraged Barton W. Stone, and he decided to do the same kind of thing at Cane Ridge. So <clears throat> he organized uh, in August the Cane Ridge meeting in August 7 through 12, 1801. Now notice that all these camp meetings, both the first one there and these, are held in the summer. They're held in either June, maybe July or August. Why? Uh, we talked about this uh, earlier when we talked about camp meetings. This is because the people are on, on agricultural schedule. They're farmers primarily, and they have to get their crops in. So part of it's the weather, and part of it is the, uh, the nature of the crops. Yeah, so we see that uh, he begins to uh, hold this meeting 
here, and the meetings will typically be then. They like to hold them. In fact, they could plan them when there was a full moon. Because remember, as we mentioned before, the people have to come, travel long distance. They have to provide their own food uh, wherever they're going to sleep, a tent, in a wagon, under a wagon. They have to cook their own food, maybe bring some animals with them, maybe a few chickens or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, when the food starts to run out or the weather gets bad, this is when people decide to go home. Well, the Cane Ridge meeting that Barton W. Stone organized, it's listed in about every American history textbook and uh, certainly church history textbooks. It's the most important camp meeting that was ever held, uh, certainly in America. And this is the high point of the Second Great Awakening. Several local ministers will promote this, and thousands upon thousands attend. Here is a drawing of the Cane Ridge Revival, sketch, a sketch by an artist. Here's the Cane Ridge Meeting House. Here's Barton W. Stone standing on a stump. You know, when he came back to visit Cane Ridge you know, after he had, had left, he went out and he pointed to a stump outside the door and he said, this, this is the stump where I preached. And so we know that there were thousands there and multiple people preaching at the same time. <clears throat> Barton W. Stone said he preached. He got up on a stump so that people could see him and hear him better because this is part of the problem. You don't have uh, any sort of um, loudspeakers, right? There's no public address system. You just have to speak, and the people <clears throat> need to try to hear you. So they sort of gather around. But obviously, when you have thousands of people there outside, it's going to be very hard to hear. The estimates are between twenty and 30,000 people from as far away as Ohio and Tennessee, and also, of course, Kentucky, come to the Cane Ridge and come to the meeting house of course, they're not going to fit inside, uh, but uh, they're going to meet on the outside on the grounds. And as you can see it represented here in this sketch, just wall-to-wall -wall people. The numbers, of course, they didn't have good counts. There were no tickets. There was no gate. Uh, some of the people who did the estimates were those who were military, uh, people with a military background who had uh, experience um, estimating you know, troop numbers by looking at them from a distance. Well, at any rate, uh, 20 to 30,000 was the estimate. Now, who was it that came? Of course, Presbyterians. That's who Barton W. Stone, he's a Presbyterian, but it wasn't just Presbyterians. They were Methodists. They were Baptists. There were probably people there who had no church membership at all. Some of them came, of course, because they are interested in, in things religious, some came uh, for entertainment value or just something to do. Four or five preachers spoke simultaneously at different areas around uh, Cane Ridge. And uh, when the food starts to run out, then that's when it ends. Okay. So, I mean, they're, they're there for uh, from the 7th through the 12th, you know, so they're about uh, almost a week. Uh, or so, six six days um, or so. And uh, also, of course, here, spiritual exercises. And we mentioned that in the camp meeting presentation, but this would be people falling over, sometimes being called slain in the spirit, that kind of thing. People barking, making barking, bark, barking sounds. This is where it's said that the, uh, the you know these camp meetings where people do that is where they got the idea of barking up a tree. You're barking up the wrong tree because they made a barking sound. Some people would run. They would just run and sometimes fall over. They would sing sort of uncontrollably. Uh, laughing was one of the things. Well, a lot of things going on, and it's pretty pretty different. I mean, people see this as like, you know. You're out, you're a farmer out in the middle of nowhere, and you go, here's suddenly 20, 30,000 people, and people are running around barking and falling down and 
I mean, this is uh, these these people did not have what you have. They did not have uh, a uh, pocket uh, computer uh, which has every uh, everything on it. You surf the world, right? What I call the interwebs, and uh, you know, you're doing your tickety tocks and your and your instity instity grams and your facety books and whatever else you're doing out there. And you can stream music and movies and who knows what all. They didn't have that. What did they have? They had nothing. They could read a book if they could find a book. Uh, books were expensive. Um, they'd go to church. They'd get to see people that way. And, of course, an event like this, we got to go. we got to see what this is all about. We've heard about this one that happened last year. Let's see what this is like. Well, anyway. News of this spreads far and wide. It's recorded in newspapers and, and, and so forth. And when the news hits upstate New York, where there's a group up there called the Shakers, who say, you know, these spiritual exercises, that sounds like what we do. We dance, we sing, we do this sort of stuff. So uh, they actually send out missionaries on foot from upstate New York to come to Cane Ridge, and they meet with Barton W. Stone and some of the others there. Well, what do people think in general? Of course, some people, you know, are, are excited by it. They they think it's uh, it's a wonderful thing, but some think it's satanic. It's of the devil. It's confusion. Some some saw it as satanic or evil. Some saw it as just disorder. God is a god of order. We shouldn't have all this disorder. Be still and know I am, I am God, it says. Well, others see it, of course, as an outpouring of God, an outpouring even of the Holy Spirit. Uh, many uh, sort of Pentecostal groups will trace this meeting back in their history um, and saying this is where a lot of things got started right here. So the, a lot of different people interpret this, I suppose, in different ways. But I can tell you, many Presbyterian ministers were quite alarmed, and so was the Presbyterian hierarchy, very alarmed at this. Because we have Presbyterians there associating with Methodists and Baptists. you got all kinds of people preaching. Are they licensed? Who are they? What do they believe? What's going on? What of, what of all these events, these exercises that people are doing? Uh, this is not, you know, we don't want the Presbyterian, the Synod, and the, and the Presbytery associated with this sort of thing. And overall, revivals and revivalism challenge the denominational control of the church and of doctrine. And so this is where we get this, what we call the new lights who are for revivals. The old lights are not. So this creates a big upheaval. And in fact, what we see happening then is uh, the Synod of Kentucky, which had territory uh, uh, in sort of northern Kentucky from around Lexington up to Cincinnati to southern Ohio. Uh, the Synod, this Synod had three presbyteries in it uh, under its control. And they are alerted to this. They call a special meeting. Uh, they want to look into these ministers from these different presbyteries. The Washington Presbytery, where John McNamara, John Dunleavy, uh, and D Dunlavy, and uh, John Thompson are there. And then, of course, the West Lexington Presbytery, where Robert Marshall is. And then, of course, the Transylvania Presbytery, Barton W. Stone. These three presbyteries, then, were under the umbrella of the Synod of Kentucky. And they, uh, they were investigating, looking into these ministers who had helped promote this and sort of calling them on the carpet, calling them into question. How can you hold to this revivalism and hold the predestination? How can you endorse this thing where all these people are preaching? We don't even know who. They're not licensed and so forth. Uh, and so they were, this was really creating a stir. And in this, McNamara, uh, from the Washington, when the Washington Presbytery met uh, in Springfield, Ohio, which is now Springdale. If you know Cincinnati area, 
you'll, you'll know that Springfield is up near Dayton, Ohio, but Springdale, as it's now called, they changed their name because of the confusion over the two Springfields, is on the north side of Cincinnati. Well, they were meeting up there at the Springfield, Ohio, and uh, basically they denounced McNamara. They said he is an anti-Calvinist, which was probably true. And, uh, well, I think it was true. <laughs> Others defended him and said, well, you know, you got to give him a chance. But he, he is, he is uh, denounced. But Noah, they didn't kick him out. They didn't kick him out at this point. But it becomes clear to these five uh, ministers that they're in trouble and that, that what they want to do is certainly not what the uh, synod and the presbytery are wanting them to do. And so uh, eventually then in September of 1803, McNamara and Thompson are voted down. That is, they are, they are kicked out, basically. You're no longer a minister in our, uh, endorsed by our synod, by our presbytery. Okay. Now, this will then cause the, uh, the five ministers to meet in January of 1804 at the Cane Ridge Meeting House. They will meet there, and they will make their new presbytery. We'll just make our own presbytery. They kicked us out. That's all right. We'll make our own. Marshall Stone, Thompson, McNamara, and Dunleavy, they, they meet there, and they say, okay, let's form a new presbytery. We're going to call it the Springfield Presbytery after Springfield, Ohio, which now is Springdale, Ohio, because, you know, it's just kind of a, well, they, they're the ones that kicked you out, so let's just call it, the, they're not called the Springfield Presbytery, let's call ourselves that. So they did. And uh, they will have 15 congregations between these five ministers that will follow them into this presbytery. So obviously, Presbyterians are going to take notice of this. And uh, they write in 1804 then, an apology for renouncing the jurisdiction of the Synod of Kentucky. They say, we're not part of the Synod of Kentucky, and we form the Springfield Presbytery. And here's Barton W. Stone. This, this will be a short-lived uh, presbytery, because it starts in January of 1804, and uh, it's going to dissolve shortly thereafter. Well, Marshall Stone and Thompson write this renunciation of the jurisdiction of the Synod of Kentucky. Well, uh, eventually, the, you know, they, they, they are influenced by a guy by the name of Rice Haggard, uh, who says, you know, why are you guys calling yourselves Presbyterians? He had said the same kind of things to Methodists, the O'Kelly movement over in North Carolina and Virginia. He said, why, why are you calling yourselves Republican Methodists? Why are you guys calling yourself Springfield Presbytery? Are you really Presbyterians? Are you following the Presbyterian creed? Uh, well, no. Why don't you just call yourself something? You see, notice this, this Springfield Presbytery only lasts about six months. They have a meeting in Cane Ridge. They sign the last will and testament of the Springfield Presbytery. That's what you see them doing here. This is a stained glass window from that superstructure that's around the Cane Ridge Meeting House. And notice we have the five who are here. Marshall, your stone in the center. Thompson, McNamara, and Dunleavy. And David Perviance will join them. Who is this mysterious ghost-like creature? Very pale. Well, some stories have taken up about that. Uh, some people suggest that maybe just the artist put this in here for balance. Because there's only, you know, there's only these six people that sign it. Other people suggest, well, this is the artist's way of representing Jesus. You know, that Jesus was there. This is kind of an imagery of Jesus. Well, I don't know. You make up your own story. But uh, David Perviance, who had joined in that six months, will also sign it. Okay, he joined them in the spring of 1804. And, uh, and so we're going to see that uh, these six men will sign it. Five had started it, six will dissolve it about six months later. Well, what's in this name? You know, the name can lead to strife. You know, we're not going to quote Shakespeare here, a rose by any other name. But 
Basically, you see out front of the Cane Ridge Meeting House this marker from the Kentucky Department of Highways, a historical marker built in 1791 by the Presbyterians. Barton W. Stone began his ministry in 1796, and then he had a famous revival here in 1801, Cane Ridge Revival. And then the Springfield Presbytery dissolved here, and the Christian Church launches June 28, 1804. So this is an important date. This is where we can say the Christian church begins, certainly here in Kentucky, and where this stone movement, uh, which of course will grow and grow over the years, uh, got its start right here at the Cane Ridge Meeting House. But what about this name? They call themselves Christians now, but not Presbyterians. Well, others didn't like what they were doing, and they called them uh, New Lights or Stoneites or Marshallites. These were sort of disparaging terms, right? That uh, you, you, know, you don't want to call yourselves Presbyterians. You don't want to follow Presbyterian teaching. You're just following the teachings then of Barton W. Stone. You're following the teachings of, of Marshall. Uh, you're not following uh, the, the truth. That was sort of the implication. But they decided to take the name Christian. The name Christian then had been suggested by a guy by the name of Rice Haggard. We mentioned him earlier. He shows up in North Carolina with the uh, the O'Kelly movement and makes a suggestion. He writ, had written a pamphlet, and, and this got reprinted in different uh, journals and so forth, an address to the different religious societies on the sacred import of the Christian name. And so they will take sort of Rice Haggard's suggestion to say, you know what, we're just going to call ourselves Christians. This is a name that everyone can accept. And I think I told you a little story about when I went to an Evangelical Theological Society annual meeting wearing my name tag. At that time, I was at Kentucky Christian College, I believe it was called at that time, and a guy wanted to figure me out. You know, when you go to these meetings, try to figure people out. Is this anybody that's, that's important? We were riding on an elevator, so we didn't have much time. So he looked at me, and he goes, Kentucky, Christian. He goes, what is that? I said, well, I said, it's a, it's a small college in Kentucky. He goes, well, I could guess that. I said, it's a Christian college. Oh, yeah, I knew that. He goes, well, what, what, uh, what church is that with? What church sort of controls that? I said, well, or, or denomination. I said, no, no, no denomination controls it. Well, you know, he didn't, he didn't like that. He didn't accept it either. I'm being evasive, he thought. I said, no, isn't it? He goes, well, what creeds do you follow? And I said, we don't follow any creeds. And he said, what about the Nicene's Creed? What about the Apostles' Creed? Well, he didn't like the fact that I said uh, that they were Christian churches. He said the Christian churches support the college. And he said, aren't all the churches Christian? And so, yeah, that's the idea. The word Christian can apply to, uh, really, anyone. And that's why Rice Haggard promoted this, and I think that's why Barton W. Stone and the others decided to go with this name. Well, in later developments, out of those six signers of the last will and testament, that's what L, W, and T, out of the six of them, only two actually... Uh, stay with this Christian movement, and uh, and we're going to see what happens to the others. Uh, in fact, Stone, Barton W. Stone, and David Perviance will stay within the Christian church and be ministers and work with the churches for many years. But McNamara and Dunleavy will, in fact, go with a group who had come to the revival, those who were connected to Cane Ridge, and uh, one man donates, uh, not McNamara Dunley, but one man donates his farm, and that becomes the headquarters, the center for a new settlement of Shakers it's called Pleasant Hill, Pleasant Hill, Kentucky, and the Pleasant Hill, the Shakers of Pleasant Hill. And McNamara and Dunley become uh, big leaders within the Shaker movement, in fact, writing some of their uh, works and printing and 
being elders and that sort of thing in the movement itself. We'll talk more about the Shaker movement later. What happens to Marshall and Thompson? They actually rejoin the Presbyterian churches. They come back and say, oh, we made a mistake. Please let us back in. And uh, the Presbyterians say, okay, we'll let you back in, but here's what you're going to do. You're going to go around to the different uh, congregations, and you're going to tell them why, why you're coming back. And so this is a summary of what they said. Well, we're, going to, we're coming back because there's no organization above the local congregation. The stone, you know, the, the Christian churches, you know, these, these things are, uh, they're, they're independent. We need a hierarchy. We need a denomination. We need some other kind of control over the local congregation. And you say, well, you know, also they don't completely agree on all the doctrines. They don't hold to any creeds. And uh, because of that, there's not, at least we can't say there is complete agreement on doctrines. And so these are the these are the main reasons, and especially the doctrine of the Trinity, the atonement of Christ, and uh, of course the idea of predestination and Calvinism. So they wanted a creed, and they wanted a dominational control. So remember, the Trinity then is um, is not mentioned. The word is not mentioned in the Bible. The concept is clearly taught there. I you know I I created for you. Look at this. It's just a, an amazing diagram. It will completely explain the Trinity to you. Well, this is uh, it's often displayed as a circle with a triangle in it. There is three in one. So God is unified. That's the circle. But there's three parts: the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, it was Saint Patrick who tried to describe the Trinity by picking a clover that had three parts to the leaf. It was one clover with three parts to the leaf, three in one. Some people have described it like an egg, a chicken egg. It has the shell, right? It has the white part. It has the yolk. It's one egg but three parts. Well, there are different ways to do it. it none of those are perfect examples. It is a difficult concept uh, to sort of break down and easily explain. But uh, it's certainly taught there in, in the scriptures. But these guys went back and they said, we, we are uh, going to come back. And then, then the synod reinstated them and said, we want you to go around. And we want you to admit your error. And we want you to go around to the different congregations and endorse the Westminster Confession and become critics of this new movement. And that's what they did. They visit former congregations where they had been and they had worked, and uh, they wrote even this document, a uh, pamphlet kind of thing, a little book, a brief historical account of sundry things in the doctrine of states, state of the Christian church. Well, here's the tombstone of Robert, Robert Marshall, and this is the tombstone of his wife. His tombstone's in pretty bad shape. It's not too far from Cane Ridge. Uh, it's, it's there around Lexington area. He's buried and his wife. And uh, so he will spend the rest of his time with the Presbyterians criticizing what, uh, what Stone and others were doing. Well, what about, uh, what of David Perviance? Elder David Perviance, he's called here. Here is uh, his uh, biography. Um, Perviance will move to Ohio, and uh, he will keep working with the churches there. But he will also decide to run for state government, and he's part of the state government um, of Ohio. And he will uh, move to Ohio, spend the rest of his time in Ohio. Stone, of course, stays at Cane Ridge and preaching there and at Concord until 1812. And after 1812, uh, one of the things we're going to see happens is uh, a big event in Barton's life is that his wife will uh, pass away of illness. And um, he got married once and 
1801, and he got married again in 1811. But um, after his first wife dies, he has daughters, and the daughters are then, he has daughters, and uh, he will basically, after his first wife dies, he will turn his the care of his daughters over to members of the congregation. He'll go out preaching. Uh, he will eventually marry his wife's cousin, and she will become his second wife, uh, therefore. And um, <clears throat> he will, once that happens, his wife is from Tennessee. He, he will eventually move to Tennessee, not too far from Nashville. Uh, his father-in-law had a large piece of land there. Barton, I think, thought he would get that land eventually. It would become clear, becomes clear to him he will not. He decides to leave. But he does evangelistic work in Kentucky and Tennessee for about four years, and he comes back to Lexington area. <clears throat> in 1816, it becomes clear his his stepfather is not his stepfather. His father-in-law will not give him uh, uh, any sort of indication he's going to be able to take over that land at some point. So he he takes his wife and uh, moves back to Kentucky. He teaches school in Lexington. He helps start the Hill Street Christian Church, which uh, no longer exists because it's actually was kind of. It had gotten to be an older area, but uh, it was sort of wiped out when they built Rupp Arena. If you know anything about Kentucky, you probably have heard of Rupp Arena, home of the uh, UK basketball franchise. And uh, so it's actually part of the parking area of uh, Rupp Arena is where the church once sat. By the way, uh, it's a sacred sacred spot for Kentucky because of the basketball, right? I'm sure you're all UK basketball fans. You bleed blue, as they say. And by the way, uh, one thing you may not know is that all the churches in Kentucky, I think it might be a state law, they have to be built so that when you walk in and you're facing the front of the church, you're actually facing Rupp Arena, much like Mecca. I made that last part up. All right, so we see uh, that in 1819, the principal he was, becomes principal of the Rittenhouse Academy in Georgetown, Kentucky, which is just north of Lexington. And so you can see he's in this area then. Uh, once again, of course, he will come back. He'll be preaching at churches. He'll go back and preach occasionally at Cane Ridge. Um, and he helped start many churches in that central we might call it Central Kentucky, Lexington, Georgetown area. Here, by the way, is another one of those stained glass windows. This is showing Barton W. Stone and Raccoon John Smith shaking hands at the Hill Street Christian Church in 1832, signifying the joining, the merging of the Stone and Campbell movements. Raccoon John Smith will represent the Campbell side and, of course, Barton W. Stone, the Stone side. And um, the unification really takes, and uh, within a few years, it's hard to tell the difference. There's a lot of mergers, and it's really a very successful merging of the, uh, of the two groups into one. Well, what about Stone's later life? And here, another one of these stained glass windows from the Cane Ridge superstructure. This is showing Barton W. Stone at a printing press. He's printing the journal which he will publish for much of his life, certainly his later life. In 1824, he meets with uh, Alexander Campbell. They have discussions. They talk about what they have uh, to, what they have that's similar in mind. And uh, this is probably planting the seed that perhaps they could merge. I think probably Barton W. Stone was much more interested in unifying maybe than Campbell, although, you know, Campbell is not opposed to it. In 1826, he begins that journal I talked about, The Christian Messenger. He started a monthly publication called The Christian Mess Messenger in 1826. He will continue that uh, for the rest of his life. 
Sometimes he had a hard time bringing it out each month because he was not a wealthy man. Uh, he struggled with his finances his whole life, and buying the paper and all that to print it out, paying for the postage, was quite expensive. <clears throat> so sometimes the the paper upon which it is printed was not the best. It, they've all been reprinted. If you're interested in seeing them, you can get them in bound form. Uh, I'm sure you can get most of them online as well if you're interested in seeing what he wrote. And, of course, as we already mentioned, in 1832 at the Hill Street Church there in Lexington, he will participate in the merger of the Stone Movement, called the Christian Movement, and the merger of the Campbell Movement, often called the Disciples or Disciples of Christ, merger. And uh, two years later, he will move to Jacksonville, not Florida, Jacksonville, Illinois, which is in the western part, I would say, sort of west central. Um, it's, it's, it's west of Springfield. It's east of St. Louis in that area there in Jacksonville. He'll move. He'll get a farm. He'll begin, uh, when he shows up there, um, you know, he'll begin preaching in churches and he will go out and going sort of revivals and he will go out to this new frontier, you know, that held a lot of promise, a place called Missouri. <clears throat> and he will actually die in Missouri, even though he's living in Illinois, he, his daughter lives in Hannibal, Missouri. So, you know, when, when he moved to Jacksonville, Illinois, there were two churches there. One was a stone church, one was a Campbell church. They both wanted him to preach for them. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I will preach for you, but you two have to merge. And so they did merge. <laughs> then he preached for the combined congregation. Um, he had a farm, he would preach, he would go out on sort of revivals and teaching. Uh, and uh, his daughter who lived in Hannibal, Hannibal you might know is right along the Mississippi River, right across from Illinois. Famous because of a guy by the name of Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain, who wrote a lot of books there. And in fact, Mark Twain was, uh, he was, he had a good friend whose name was Barton. It was actually Barton W. Stone's grandson. Because Barton W. Stone's uh, daughter had moved there with her husband, and they raised their family there. And when he became ill on a preaching tour, they <clears throat> took him to his daughter's house. And once once there, Barton W. Stone will in fact uh, die in his daughter's house in Hannibal, Missouri. I went to visit Hannibal, Missouri, and I wanted to look and see what I could find of connection with Barton W. Stone. And what I did find, of course, is this connection between Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, and Barton W. St uh, Stone. And I found the graveyard where Barton W. Stone's uh, wife is now buried. You know, when Barton W. Stone died, he was... When Barton W. Stone died... Um, he was eventually taken back to his farm in Jacksonville, but his wife, left with tending to the farm, eventually decides to sell the farm and to move to Hannibal. <clears throat> and so Barton W. Stone's body will be moved to Kentucky, and he'll be buried outside the Cane Ridge Meeting House. She will live with her daughter and eventually uh, pass away there and be buried in this cemetery. This cemetery... Uh, Evidently, what is what inspired Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain, uh, in in uh, his adventures of Tom Sawyer, to write about uh, an event that took place. It says in a graveyard of the old-fashioned Western kind. It was on a hill about a mile and a half from the village. This is where Tom and Huck, hiding behind a great elm tree, watched as Injun Joe killed Doc Robinson, robbed the body, and then put the fatal knife into Muff Pat Patter's hand. Okay, so to get out. So I, I don't know if you've read The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but if you go to Hannibal, of course, they've got a museum there. They've got the house. They've got, a, they've got all kinds of things that relate to <clears throat> Samuel Clements, Mark Twain, 
and Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and all that sort of stuff. Well, as I looked around the, the graveyard there, I found the burial place of Cecilia Stone, the wife of Barton W. Stone. This is her stone here in bad shape. And so uh, people have created a new stone for her with a plaque. Uh, she dies in 1857 at the age of 64. And here is the plaque that's on there. It says Barton W. Stone, founder of the Christian Church. Celia and Barton were married after his first wife died in childbirth. And they were married for 33 years, had six children. They came to Illinois because of their opposition to slavery, their desire to spread the gospel in the American frontier. Barton Stone died in Hannibal at his daughter's house in 1844. Uh, in Hannibal, of course, and Celia moved here shortly thereafter, spent her later years with her children and grandchildren who were close childhood friends of Samuel Clemens, Mark Twain. Blessed are those who die in the Lord, it says, placed here by the crossing in 2013. And here is the, the stone itself. You see it's well worn. Here's the uh, uh, Cane Ridge Cemetery. Outside of it is that bust of Barton W. Stone, a bronze that was placed here on this limestone. Uh, very nicely done. And then here is the grave site for Barton W. Stone. You can see his obelisk marker. You can see where he's buried here. Now people say, are these the coffins? Are they buried inside of there? No, those are solid stone. This was something that was done in England. Scotland, Ireland, these was a kind of a practice, a grave marker. It would be a big stone sit on top of the grave. But this obelisk was placed here when Barton W. Stone, after the time Barton W. Stone was buried, to uh, indicate who was there. And here is the way it looks. You see in the background here, more of the cemetery. They have Revolutionary War veterans back here and so forth. But this marker, let's zoom in. And here is the marker with Barton W. Stone. Let's uh, take a look at the uh, close-up of it. The Church of Christ of Cane Ridge and other generous friends in Kentucky have caused this monument to be erected as a tribute of affection and gratitude to Barton W. Stone, minister of the gospel and the distinguished reformer of the 19th century, born 1772, died 1844. His remains lie here. Okay, so uh, reportedly, uh, Alexander Campbell, when he heard them call, saw this and said, they called Barton W. Stone uh, the distinguished reformer of the 19th century. Alexander Campbell said it should read a distinguished reformer of the 19th century. Well, we'll talk more about Alexander Campbell later. I hope this has been informative to you, and I hope you've learned a little bit along the way. We're going to end it here for now, but I hope you have a great day. Take care.